It's good to be in his house and it's good to open his word and see great truths. We're going to continue today to look at our subject matter of the last few weeks, which is your walk with God impacts your nation. And it ought to. Your walk with God has influence. Jesus said you're the salt of the earth and you're the light of the world, which means that you are to make an impact wherever you are wherever he has placed you. And I don't like this idea that that people have no, unless you're in a position of prominence or uh, unless you're a celebrity or unless you have a high office that you can't really influence things because you can influence things right now. We're going to look at that this morning. We already have. Last week we looked at First Timothy chapter 2, I believe. Uh, we spoke about the importance of prayer. As we have just done, pray for our uh, governing leaders, our rulers, our kings, and all that in authority. And the effect of that prayer and the uh, the prayer of a righteous, the effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So we have to believe that our prayers have a, an impact in the throne room of God, and that that is then released on the earth. Amen? You have to know that prayer changes things, to use that phrase. Now, why are we reading this today from First Chronicles chapter 2 about the building of the house of the Lord? Because in this we see uh, that King David, the Davidic throne, which he would pass on to his son, Solomon, also involved that Solomon would build a house. Now, we have this thing goes on, people say, oh, church and state should never be together. We should separate them. But folks, church and state were not separated in the old covenant. In fact, what happened here was that God instructed that Solomon, the king, the head of state, would build a temple to house his presence. And, you know, I believe that God doesn't change his pattern. Men change. And, you know, men say, well, we don't want a king. We want an elected official. We want to choose our own leaders. And it's interesting to me, and I'm not America bashing here, but it's interesting to me that what we hear from Americans is, well, we got rid of tyranny. We got rid of this one man can tell us what to do. But now they have presidents that have far more powers than any king of the United Kingdom has ever had. Amen? So it doesn't matter how you, how, how you, how you do it. Ultimately, one man will end up in control. And if we don't have a godly uh, apparatus supporting that, then that man will be a dictator or a tyrant. And we've had American presidents who have had far more powers than some of the worst tyrants ever. And they have exercised them. The only thing is, you don't get to read about it because you, it's not in the media. But anyway, that's a whole different sermon. Um, and I'm not going to go there today. What I am going to say is, God's system of government is kingdom. Thy kingdom come, not thy republic come, not thy president come. Jesus is not the president. He is the king of kings and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Why is that important to this? Because Jesus is going to inhabit this throne of David that Solomon here uh, uh, inherits from his father and builds this temple. So this connection between the head of state, the king of Israel, and the spiritual dimension and life of the nation, in fact, the very house where the Shekinah glory of God I've said this before in those days, if you wanted to encounter the presence of God, you had to travel to the land of Israel, you had to go to Jerusalem, and you wouldn't get near the Holy of Holies. So you're, unless you were the high priest, and that but once a year. So the presence of God was restricted in the sense of you couldn't enter his direct presence, but you could have proximity to it. You just had to go to Jerusalem. You could go to the to, to outside where the temple, or certainly outside the Holy of Holies, 
And you, you could get as close to it as you can, but you couldn't touch God's presence. How much superior is the new covenant, friends? That that very presence lives in you. You don't have to travel across the world. He lives in you. Man is the habitation of God, a dwelling place of God through the Spirit. And knowing that, there ought to amplify your faith to believe, well, if God lives in me, then I can impact the nations by my prayers, by my sharing his word. But what I want to show you here is this. Solomon built a house for the Lord God. But then I want to just take you further forward to Second Chronicles and a famous um, passage here, a famous verse, sorry, and verse 14. This is, well, let's just read from verse 12, okay? So Solomon builds a temple and they dedicate it to the Lord and the glory of the Lord filled the house so that the priest could not stand to minister. Do you know that, that God's glory is supposed to fill his house? Your house is designed to be a place that God fills with glory. And that's speaking about your body, and it's speaking about our corporate body in what's the ecclesia or church or the congregation or the assembly of God. But here it says, And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night, verse 12 of 2 Chronicles chapter 7, And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer, but we'll look at that prayer in a minute. And I've chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. This is after Solomon builds the temple of the house of God. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, um, if my this is the one that's very famous, and people quote this all the time, but they, they only quote it and they don't fully understand it. And they don't understand what God was responding to. And what God was responding to ought to electrify every person in this room if we understood it. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, we need to do all these things, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Notice that it's my people. That's so important. It's not the sinners. They are not going to uh, humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Not in this covenant. Because they're sinners. They don't know about this stuff. And if they do know about it, they don't want to do it. He says, if my people. So when people say, well, we're God's people. We're called by his name. Well, are we doing the things that it says... Are we turning from our wicked ways? Do you know you can be in church, you can be filled with God's Holy Spirit, you can be an active, fervent member, but still have wicked ways. You can still have idols. You can still have things that, and, and even just beliefs that you've been taught, the traditions of men. And you believe you're fervently serving God, but wicked, wicked doesn't always just mean outright evil and, you know, like bank robber evil or drug dealer evil or gangster murderer evil. It simply, wicked means to be turned away from the, from the true uh, righteous path that God wants. Now, what does he say here? That's what I want to show you. This is important. Verse 12, I have heard thy prayer. Isn't it good to know that God hears your prayer? Now you understand this, Solomon, why do we pray for King Charles every week? Because there is a covenantal relationship between the king of a nation and the people of a nation and God who is over the nations. There is a covenant. People submit to a king and submit to God and submit because the Bible very clearly says and, and makes this connection, particularly when it comes to Israel, and we'll look at that in a minute, that there is a connection between honoring and submitting to the king of Israel 
and also submitting to God. You, if you're in rebellion against the king, in other words, you're in rebellion against the Lord. Well, I don't like this king. Well, you're a rebel. Oh, but you don't understand. He said in 1979, you're, you're still a rebel. Amen. Now, we don't blindly follow kings uh, and, and that, the covenanting times, the Puritan times. They taught us these things. It is okay to resist tyranny. It is okay to, to rebuke kings. But only if you're submitting biblically and only if that you're not a rebel. Amen? Well, you know, I'm a Republican. Well, sadly then, you are against Almighty God. All right. Well, that's maybe strong for some, but I don't care. It's still the word of God. Honor the Lord and honor the King. And do not be associated with what the Hebrew word shana means, those given to change, but what it means is those who rebel and turn away in their hearts from the true faith. Anyway, I want to show you this. I have heard thy prayer. First, sorry, Second Chronicles chapter 6. If you go back a chapter, you'll see this prayer. And it's a long prayer, so I don't really want to have time um, to read it all. Uh, so I just want to read part of it because, well, let's just read from verse 19 just now. Well, let's read from verse 18. My apologies. Will God in very deed dwell with men on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house which I have built. Now Solomon's speaking about that temple. But we are speaking here today about this house which God has built. Amen? You know, men's hands didn't make this body. Only God made this body. And, and all of us. Have respect. This is Solomon speaking to God. As the king of Israel at the dedication of the temple. Have respect, therefore, to the prayer of thy servant and to his supplication, O Lord my God, to hearken unto the cry and the prayer which thy servant prayeth before thee, that thine eyes may be open upon this house day and night, upon the place whereof thou hast said that thou wouldst put thy name there, to hearken unto the prayer which thy servant prayeth toward this place. Hearken, therefore, unto the supplications of thy servant. Just let me just interject here. This is the prayer God said to Solomon, I've heard this. And of thy people Israel, which they shall make toward this place. Hear thou from thy dwelling place, even from heaven, and when thou hearest, forgive. If a man sin against his neighbor, and an oath be laid upon him to make him swear, and the oath cometh before thine altar in this house, then hear thou from heaven, and do, and judge thy servants. And so on. Verse 24. If thy people Israel be put to the worst before the enemy, because they have sinned against thee, shall return and confess thy name, and pray and make supplication before thee. In uh, thy house. Then hear thou from heaven to forgive the sin of thy people. Verse 26. When the heaven is shut up, there is no rain because they have sinned against thee. Yet if they pray toward this place and confess thy name and turn from their sin, when thou dost afflict them. You see here that Solomon is doing a contractual agreement, a covenant with God to say, if these things happen in the land and we pray, Hear from heaven and forgive. Okay? And forgive the sin of thy servants. Verse 27 of thy people, Israel, when you have taught them the good way, wherein they should walk and send rain. So it goes on and on. And then he says this. Hear from the heavens. Verse 33. Even from thy dwelling place. Let's go back here. I just want to show you this. Verse 28. This is a bit I want us to look at. If there be death in the land, if there be pestilence, or let me put it in modern terms, if the supermarket shelves are empty and there's plagues and viruses, 
if there be blasting or mildew, locusts or caterpillars. In other words, if things aren't right, if their enemies besiege them in the cities of their land, and I shared recently about this, you know, at one stage we were supposed to have been had Russian nuclear subs roundabout, and I think the North Sea and everything. It's, just, it's all here. Whatsoever sore or whatsoever sickness there be, COVID-19, COVID whatever, oh, the new thing that's coming, bird flu, every flu. Look at this. This is the verse I want us to see. This is what God said to Solomon. I heard that. I heard your prayer, Solomon. Look what he says. Then what prayer or what supplication or what supplication soever shall be made of any man? Let me read that again to you. What prayer or what supplication soever shall be made of any man, one man, or of all thy people, Israel? What he's saying is, we can all pray, but Lord, I'm asking you, if one man prays, that's all it's going to take. One man. Oh, well, you know, we need... We, we need a prayer movement, Pastor. We need to get thousands praying. I agree with that and, and all oh, that we would. But you know, one man, any man, Solomon says. We call Solomon the wisest man that ever lived. Amen? This is wisdom. To ask God, can we have an agreement? Almighty God. That if anything ever goes wrong, enemies, pestilence, uh, mildew, black, he's, he's listing all these things that could go wrong and he's saying it's our sin. But can we have an agreement that if one man in the land of Israel will pray and repent and will turn from their wicked ways, that will you heal the land? Any man excuse me, of all thy people. But everyone shall know his own sore and his own grief and shall spread forth his hands in this house. Then hear thou from heaven thy dwelling place and forgive and render unto every man according to all his ways. Then he says, verse 31, that they may fear thee to walk in thy ways so long as they live in the land which thou gavest unto our fathers. Solomon could have said, if I can find a thousand men to pray, if I can start a prayer movement throughout the land, will you hear from heaven? Solomon had the wisdom to say, from one man to all the land, will you hear from heaven? Now, the reason I'm saying this today and the reason I'm sharing this today is what we've been looking at these last several weeks, which is very simply this. Your walk with God impacts your nation. If you're that one man, if you're that one woman and nobody else follows your example, that's all it takes with Solomon's covenant with God because God says to him over in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, he says, I have heard. And the Lord appeared to him by night and said to him, I heard that prayer. I, I know what you were doing, Solomon. You know, the Lord could have said, you're quite fly. You, you know what you were doing there. Because, and we, but see, this is what I'm trying to say. Well, if we can only get Billy Graham, if we can only get the mighty preachers, if we can only get, you know, if these men do it, no, folks, one man. It's not about uh, political leaders. It's not about church leaders. It's not about men of uh, great esteem or, or great reputation or great academic achievement or celebrity status. And it's not about, oh, we need, we need hundreds of thousands of people praying. Folks, one man, do we believe the word of God? Now, I know there's more than one man, and you know that. But I, but I have to say this. There aren't many who will pray for the nation the way the nation must be prayed for. 
Amen. And you might find one man in a town, one man in a city, or one man in a congregation. But, you know, it only takes one man. And I believe the Lord is saying to us today, will you be that man? Will you be that woman? And it's not about, all oh, having grandiose schemes and plans. It's about, as our brother David said in his opening prayer, falling on our faces before the Lord and saying, Lord, this nation needs a turning around. And I will repent for all the sins of this nation. God will hear the, the header here in my Bible. God will hear if Israel repents. Now that's the relationship that kings have with nations, or should I say that kings should have with nations. And I, I will repeat this to you, as I've shared many times before. It is believed that our royal house today, our royal family, is descended from this Davidic family, these Davidic kings. And I know the royals themselves believe that and have charts tracing their ancestry. We have these charts in this building. And folks, if that's the case, then what that means is, is that covenant and that agreement and that contract that King Solomon made with God for his people. You know why Solomon was given all the wisdom that he was given? Because his heart was to govern wisely. He had a heart for his people. That we could have asked, God told him, you could have asked for in the necks of your enemies financial might and so on. But Solomon says, no, I just want to be a good leader. I want to have the wisdom to govern this people wisely. That was in his heart. And you and I today can pray that we will have leaders like that in our nation and that King Charles will have that heart for the nation. Amen? Because we're part of this. We're part of this covenantal relationship and agreement we have our part to play because if any man, if any man, what Solomon was saying was that this nation can be turned around if one man, any man, and of course that includes women, women can pray too, amen? If any person will take the time to go before God and say this nation needs you, then God will impact the nation, we're just using that phrase, for good and, and bring that nation to repentance. Bring that nation back aligned with his throne and aligned with his will and aligned with his purpose. It only takes any man. Now, if all the people do it, great. If, we, if, if there's hundreds, if there's thousands, then I believe that's a wonderful thing and I'm believing God for that. But I'm also looking at Scripture with absolute astonishment and realizing this man, this Solomon understood if I can just get God to hear one man, then the nation can come back to him. And so it begins with you and I. And I'm reminded even as I'm speaking here about Reese Hills during the war years. That one man. That one man that stood before the Lord. And of course he did. He started a, a, a wee prayer group in his place um, down in, in Wales. And I think they ended up with about 100 of them would meet two or three times a week during the war to pray that God would give victory to this nation. And also remember that Reese Howells, uh, he wasn't just an intercessor, he was also a prophet, and he stood up before the war very publicly, very, very publicly. L listen to this. He told the Christian world, he told the world, because he, people reported in the, the, the secular press what Reese Howells used to say because he was so respected. And he stood up, and he said, he told all the politicians, God has told me there will be no war with Germany. I'm telling you now, there will be no war. The Lord hath revealed it unto me. And of course, what happened? There was war. So that man's reputation was not just tarnished, utterly shredded and ruined because he prophesied falsely. But you know what he did? He repented. He realized that he'd got it wrong and he then started to get people to pray for victory. And people will tell you, that I don't have time to get into it all, but the prayers of Reese Howells and that small band of intercessors brought great victory, of course, as we know.
or we wouldn't be here today in this capacity. It takes the prayer of one man. That's all it takes. Now, we're not believing that just one person. And I'm quite sure, and I know people in this room pray for the nation. So there isn't just one man. But isn't it wonderful to know that really what Solomon was saying was the fate of the nation, or the course of the nation is a better term, can be directed not just by kings sitting on thrones. Because what happens if you have a, a bad king? And Solomon in his latter days turned out to be not a, a great king. The Bible says that he did wickedly in the sight of the Lord. I mean, it's, it's sobering. But here in these early days, Solomon, in a sense, anticipating what Jesus would do, as we've looked at, Jesus says, all authority is given to, to me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. Solomon anticipated and asked God to give authority in prayer and intercession and supplication and giving of thanks. He asked God to give authority to any man who dared to take it in that place of prayer and repentance. So brothers and sisters, we're way back in the old covenant. This is a new covenant idea. The Bible says you and I are kings and priests. We are a royal priesthood, a peculiar people. And as I look around, there are certainly many who qualify for that phrase, peculiar people. But we're peculiar because God has given us authority. As I said, the Puritans, the Covenanters, they understood God has made us the elect. It is incumbent upon us, therefore, to govern the nation in prayer. We don't take up rifles and hand them out and start a militia here. We don't have to because authority has been granted to us in that place of prayer. One, one man, Solomon said, if any man, or all the people, it doesn't matter, but let's just make it one man, any man. And you know what's good about that? It could be the weakest of saints. You don't have to be a spiritual giant. You don't have to be Smith Wigglesworth or John G. Lake. You just be that any man and go before the Lord. And today, tonight, before you go to bed, say, I'm going to be that man, that woman. And I'm going to ask the Lord, hear from heaven, heal this land, bring it back to you. Because I believe one of the things that God has called me to do as a pastor and a minister of the gospel is to encourage and exhort people to pray for the nation. So that we don't just have one man, but that we do indeed have many men and women who are crying out to God, not just begging and bawling and squalling, but asking God, thy kingdom come, thy will be done here in Britain and these islands as it is in heaven. The Lord bless you.